You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 28. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, this week's topic is salt. Doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But it is. Salt is an essential ingredient in cheese making. And let me tell you why. Salt is, it, its primary function in cheese making is, it's a few things. It's moisture control, rind formation. It controls the production of lactic acid, which is the process where the starter culture turns lactose into lactic acid. Uh, It's a texture improver and a microbiological control, and it's, of course, a flavour enhancer. So salt is always applied near the end of the cheese-making process. Now, it can be added to the curds when it's milled. It can be applied to the outside of the rind, so similar to uh, when you're making a kefili, or a camembert or a brie, you can make a brine solution and you can soak your cheese in that. So like Parmesan, Romano, Gouda, Edam, um, and those types of cheeses. And finally, you can preserve your cheese in brine uh, like feta and halloumi. So the effects that salt has on cheese Some happen immediately and then others, it continues during the ageing process. So moisture control is uh, one of the main things that salt is used for. It draws water from the curds to the surface of the cheese. And depending on the method you use, um, the whey is usually drained away from the curds and it helps develop the rind. So the rind, by rubbing salt on the rind of the cheese, um, as you do in some cheeses, uh, it dehydrates the cheese and it forms a crust. Now the crust is usually smooth uh, in the case of mo- in case of most cheeses. So that um, also acts as a microbiological control because salt is used to preserve many foods in the world. Uh, it stops and inhibits food poisoning microorganisms uh, like uh, salmonella, uh, listeria, um, tuberculosis. So it actually um, kills a lot of these bacteria off and it also slows down the lactic acid production. So when you add the um, salt to the cheese, you've got to add the right amount of salt as per your recipe. Don't skimp on the salt, that's for sure. Uh, What it does, it disturbs the starter culture's fermentation and it stops it from turning lactose into lactic acid. So this controls the pH of your cheese as well. And if you don't add enough salt, then the ripening will continue. And some of the things that may happen is that you will get excessive lactic acid. Uh, It'll be a very high pH, a very sour cheese, and it won't be like Uh, the cheese you're setting out to create. So don't skimp on the salt and put it in at the right stage, the recipe says. Now it also does, um, salt does break up the casein, so it uh, allows the curd to become a little bit drier uh, and softens the cheese. So the creamier type cheeses. For instance, if you look at uh, Kefili, one of my favourite cheeses, the inside, the rind is thick, The rind is about half a centimetre thick all the way around because it's heavily salted. But the inside of that cheese is extremely creamy. And and, and because of that salt, it improves the texture of that cheese. And finally, uh, salt is a flavour enhancer. Um, It's normally used as seasonings throughout the world anyway. But what it does is it... So it changes the flavour of the cheese... Uh, not only giving it that savoury flavour, but it also does increase the action of lipase if you're 
creating a cheese with lipes like feta or mozzarella, um, and it gives it a, a higher flavour and aroma. Also, um, as I mentioned, it stops the starter culture from creating uh, lactic acid, so it, uh, it'll help sweeten the cheese, if, if that makes sense. So it, it is a flavour enhancer for the cheese. But without salt in your cheese, the right amount of salt at the right time in the recipe, your cheese will not taste as you would expect. So that's salt's role or function within cheese making. So let's talk about the different types of salt and the sort of salt you're trying to get to put into your cheese. So there are different types of salt. So there's a raw sea salt. It usually has magnesium or calcium compounds in it that have been uh, dissolved from seawater. Um, they're usually um, used for uh, bathing salts and stuff like that, raw sea salt. There's refined salt, which contains... Uh, around about 99% sodium chloride. And then there's refined salt that has things added to it. So um, iodine can be added to salt. Anti-caking agents, they can be added. And in some countries, uh, fluoride is added to salt, would you believe? Now, we won't touch on fluoride too much because um, I don't know too much about it because we don't have fluoride added salt here in Australia. But one thing we do have is iodized salt. Um, and that's where iodine, either potassium iodine, sodium iodine, or sodium iodate is added to salt. And basically what they're doing there is they're adding this so that humans that are deficient in iodine uh, in their normal diet, it actually stops diseases such as uh, th thyroid gland problems. So iodine... iodine when it's um, in the salt and you use it in cheese making, what it does is it retards or kills the growth of the cultures. So your cheese culture, um, as it should be merrily um, aging and, and just converting that last little bit of lactose into lactic acid and, and getting it up to the right pH, the iodine will actually kill them in their tracks. So uh, so don't use uh, salt that has been iod that has iodine in it or has been iodized. So make sure you check that on the label. Now, the other ingredient that they usually put into salt is anti-caking agent. And you'll see it on the back. It'll say salt and anti-caking agent. Um, some of the anti-caking ingredients are things like calcium carbonate, which is chalk, magnesium carbonate, sodium aluminosilicate. Um, and these are all anti-caking things. And what they do is they stop the salt crystals from bulking together or melting uh, melting together when there's moisture in the air. So these things really, um, if you're going to direct salt your cheese, I recommend that you don't use salt with anti-caking agents in it. Um, however, if you're going to make a brine solution, then yeah, that sort of salt's okay because all that stuff will just sit in the bottom anyway. So just make sure that if you're going to use a anti uh, salt with anti-caking in it, don't use it directly on your cheese or don't mill it into your cheese. So most table salts will have anti-caking agent in it. So the sort of salts that you should be looking for, they are regular salt that doesn't have any iodine or anti-caking agents. That's, that's a given, really. So most pickling and canning salts don't have those two ingredients in it, so usually they're fine, but check the labels. Rock salt or kosher salt, usually they're larger crystals and you will have to crush those down to use in um, cheese making, but they are they usually don't have any iodine or anti-caking uh, additive in it either. Would you believe swimming pool salt, as long as it's food grade, that can be used as well, but they come in big chunks, so you'll have to crush those down. And you will find in some stores that there are, uh, it's flat flat crystals of salt and um, I'm not sure what they're called. I have seen them as like lake salt and, and and all sorts of things they're branded as. Just make sure they don't have any um, any anti-caking agents and they haven't had iodine added. 
that stuff works. So that's no problems at all. You can uh, direct salt with that, no problems at all. So you can mill it into your curds and you can rub it on the outside of your cheese. Uh, that's fine. But there's no real advantage to using that salt if you're going to make a brine. You might as well use um, normal salt with anti-caking agent. It's a lot cheaper um, so to make your brine out of that. So you don't need to buy anything fancy, no fancy cheese salt. Um, the stuff that they sell as cheese salt has bigger crystals anyway, so you'll be able to distinguish it from normal free-flowing or table salt anyway. The, the advantage that that has over that sort of table salt is, as I mentioned, it's got no anti-caking agent. However, the larger crystals, they do dissolve readily in your curds when you direct salt or you... Um, add it to the outside or rub it on the outside of your, of your cheese. So hopefully that's taken the mystery out of salt's function in cheese making and uh, you've learnt a little bit about salt's use and the different types of salt to use. Uh, sorry, the, yeah. So the, the type of salt to use within your cheese making. Okay, it's time for the news. Right, today's news article is titled The Push to Use Raw Milk in Cheese Production. Now, this is a, an audio clip from an ABC radio program called The Bush Telegraph, and it actually features Will Studd, who uh, you may know. He does the, uh, the video, the DVD, TV, or the, the TV show called Cheese Slices. Uh, it's a fabulous TV show. If you can get a hold of it on DVD, um, I highly recommend it. I think I've got about four, I think there's four seasons of it now, and uh, I've watched every single one. It's a really riveting stuff. If you're a curd nerd, um, it's pretty cool. All right, so I'll, uh, the, it's presented by Cameron Wilson, who's a reporter on that show. Um, so I'll just roll the clip now. So let's talk food regulations. The body that regulates food safety standards in Australia is Fazant's. And it's reconsidering the rules around raw milk cheeses. It's calling for submissions to see whether some aspects of the Food Standards Code should be changed to allow some cheeses to be made with raw milk. Now, making and selling products with raw milk is largely illegal in Australia at the moment. There's just a couple of exceptions that are in place. Will Studd is a long-time campaigner for the easing of restrictions around the use of raw milk. Uh, thanks for joining us, Will. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, this must be news that makes you happy, reconsidering the standards. Well, it's fantastic. It's been going on since 2004 when I made the first application. That application is still on the books with Fazans to be, to, to be resolved. Mm, OK, I should say the, the submissions are being taken as part of a five-yearly review. That's why it's on the agenda. Well, uh, pasteurisation, it kills off bacteria, which can cause things like listeria and salmonella. Surely making sure that consumers get a safe product is crucial. Oh, I think it is, yes. I, I, I don't think anyone's arguing about that, but you can achieve the same uh, level of safety with raw milk too. And that's really the point. And when you, when you look at the great traditional cheeses of Europe, most of them are made with raw milk. And it's a shame that we're not allowed to do the same here. Ausfoodnet, which is part of the federal government's health department, it says it recorded eight outbreaks of illness affecting 101 people who drank raw milk or ate raw milk products between 1995 and 2004. Isn't that proof that raw milk products are potentially more dangerous? Well, I think you have to look at, at, at uh, the story behind um, those, those figures. I mean, there's lies, lies and statistics. Um, but if you basically, if you take um, raw milk from healthy animals, it is really healthy, good for you. And, and that's really the point. I don't know where they've recorded that, but uh, if, you if you actually take that period, that's been a period when there's been mandatory pasteurisation in Australia. So the idea that, uh, that, uh, that the mandatory pasteurisation is going to prevent all that sort of thing is, is rubbish. People will do it one, one way or the other. You, you said that if you take the milk from healthy animals, that's the, that's the big if, isn't it? Well, um, I think that uh, nobody's suggesting that... Uh, one should just go off and, and make cheese without some sort of regulation, some sort of HACCP. And that's, that's really the point of, of Fazan's, is that they've come up with proposals which essentially mimic um, the, the same regulations in Europe, and the starting point is healthy animals. 
And in Australia, we're, we're blessed. We have some very healthy animals. The reason pasteurisation was introduced originally about 120 years ago was because um, animals were unhealthy and there weren't the ways to test them and there's a lot of TB around and that was why pasteurisation was introduced. And, and, and um, pasteurisation originally gets its name from Pasteur who was looking at pasteurising wine, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that never eventuated, but in the process, he found that by heating milk, it killed, it, it basically killed, killed, killed a lot of the bugs in milk, and that was considered a, a safe way to go. Uh, but these days, we we can actually test for healthy animals, and, and in Australia, we don't have TB. You know, we have a very healthy herd, herds, and and uh, it's a, it's a shame that we can't produce cheeses that really reflect a sense of place. Uh, how how does using raw milk enable that to take place? Because there's a lot of activity going on on our Twitter feed at the moment, at RN Bush Tally. Most people saying they would like the opportunity to either make or consume raw milk products, raw milk cheeses. What What is it about them that is so much different? Well, they, um, one, first of all, there's flavour. Um, secondly, there's texture and aroma. But it really comes down to aroma and, I mean, to taste. From, from, a, from a consumer point of view, but there is, it also has other implications in the sense that it, it's uh, about allowing, for example, if you're a small family farm and you're producing you know, the world's greatest milk, when it then goes off to a big cooperative and gets uh, mixed up with, with, with milk from a you know, very large herd, that's, that, there's no, no real incentive to produce really great milk. It just disappears into the pool, for example, whereas if you were able to make cheese from it, um, you, you, you could actually add value to it. Um, there are implications for animal welfare. There are implications for regional tourism. Um, you know, the, the, it's much bigger than just the whole cheese story, but essentially it starts off with flavour. So what is your argument that if you released or uh, uh, eased, I should say, some of the standards around food safety, you would have a, a reasonably profound effect on the type of farming that took place in some, some regional places in Australia? Well, it, it, it could make the difference between people being, staying on the farm and, and uh, being able to, to make a living and uh, not staying on the farm. Hmm. Because the reality, the reality of, of farming is if you look at the number of farms that's disappeared in, in Australia over the last 20 years, it's, 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 it's amazing how many have disappeared. Will Studs with me, a long-time campaigner for easing restrictions around the use of, of raw milk. We're discussing the fact that Fazant, the uh, food... Oh, well, we'll finish off the interview there. If you want to listen to the full interview, I will add that into the show notes for this episode. Um, as I said, it was a Bush part of a Bush Telegraph episode uh, on ABC Radio National. Okay, so we'll get on to listener questions. There's no voicemails this week. Um, so if you have any questions and you want to leave a voicemail for me, uh, don't forget that you can click on the speak pipe widget on the right-hand side of the blog uh, at littlegreencheese.com and uh, send those through and we'll put them up on the show and I'll answer them live. That would be lovely. Okay, we've got a few questions this week, so um, here's the first one. The first one's from uh, Kathleen Womack, and Kathleen's from somewhere in the US, uh, Monarch High School. I'm not sure where Monarch High School is, um, but it is somewhere in the US, I believe, um, by looking at the telephone number. Anyway, Kathleen's question is, Hi, Gavin. I listened to your podcast this evening and I need to ask a question about Col the Colby recipe. I was trying to figure out where you added the calcium chloride. I watched the video several times and did not find where you added it. My Colby is on the last press and I will take it out in the morning. I will mark that I did not add the ingredient and hopefully I'll have no problems. Thank you as I have enjoyed the, the recipes and will continue to make. I am really a newbie on making cheese. I have made... Ricotta, mozzarella, farm cheese, and then the Colby. My ricotta and mozzarella came out great, and I'm waiting for the other cheese to dry in the fridge. Why do you not brine the Colby? My house stays under 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so would the cheese setting out be okay? Or should I whip it? Should I whip it? Should I whip it with some brine solution? Uh, regards, Kathleen Womack. 
Well, thanks very much for your question, Kathleen. I have answered this via email already. It is a good pickup. I did not use calcium chloride in the video tutorial because I was using non-homogenized milk. So there's no need to use it. You'll find that the curd sets very well anyway. However, if you use uh, pasteurized and homogenized store-bought milk, you will need to add calcium chloride. Uh, and all of my recipes in the Little Green Cheese, uh, sorry, the uh, Keep Calm and Make Cheese ebook that I've produced um, state when you need to add calcium chloride. It sounds like you've got a pretty firm curd anyway because you're up to the last pressing and it's not all sloppy and, and anything like that. Now, traditionally, Colby's not brined uh, like the hard cheeses, the Italian hard cheeses are. Uh, it's milled with uh, salt during the, uh, the draining period and it's mixed into the curds before pressing. Now, I do recommend that you keep your cheese at, especially the Colby, around 13 degrees Celsius or 55 Fahrenheit during, the, during aging. Uh, it helps the starter culture develop the flavours and the right amount of lactic acid. All right, thanks for your question. Now, Kathleen had came, come back to me and she says that she's going to try and find a cheese fridge. Uh, she lives in, I hope I get this right, the San Joaquin Valley. I assume that's somewhere in the US. Now, once again, thanks very much for your question, Kathleen. Okay, the next question is from, this one's from my regular pen pal, David Dawson. Now, David was, I do believe, on episode five of the Little Green Cheese podcast. So if you go back to the back catalogue, uh, you'll be able to listen to what uh, David sounds like. And I won't even try to imitate his voice. He's got a lovely um, English gentleman's voice, even though he's from Canada. He emigrated. Okay, it says, uh, Hi Gavin, long time no contact, but I check your blogs regularly. This evening I was listening to your latest cheese podcast and wish I could get the voicemail speak pipe to work. A very good addition, incidentally. I wanted to make a comment about the fat content of milk and cheese, and that was the subject of the question from a nice-sounding lady called Sari. Maybe you can pass it on to her. Well, David, I will during this. <laughs> Here in Canada, the milk factory slant dairies remove all of the fat from the milk and then add back 1%, 2% or 3.25. And I expect that is similar in Australia. Um, David, I did a bit of research and in fact it is. They do take all the cream out and they add it back in depending on the product they're going to sell. Um, how or where they fit this into the homogenization process, I don't know. However... Milk from my dairy farmer friend comes in at around 4.2%, so now that no doubt the factory slant dairies use the extra fat for butter or something similar. I think if Sari used full cream milk at 4.2, her cheese will come out close to 28% fat content. The other thing I wanted to say is that I've read that when one puts curds into the cheese press and exerts perhaps excessive pressure for this early stage, if the exclude, ex, exuding whey is white, it means quite a bit of fat. I can say that my drip tray is often quite oily slash fatty and my first whey is often quite white, uh, white. All the best to you, Gavin. Glad to hear your medical problems such as back, slant, knee um, is getting behind you. Getting old is no fun. I agree. <laughs> Regards, David Dawson. Thank you very much, David. Um, a great observation. And hopefully, Sari's listening to this episode. Um, she had her question uh, mentioned in episode 26. Okay, the next question is from... Uh, this one's from Ada. Uh, I'm not sure where Ada's from. Ada says, Hi, Gavin. Will raw goat's milk be okay for the recipes you are presenting in this book? Uh, thank you. Ada is referring to uh, keep calm and make cheese. Uh, yes, you can use uh, raw goat's milk in the recipes. It won't taste the same as cow's milk, but it will make the cheeses. The cheeses will form okay. Um, like I said, the taste will be different. Um, I do suggest, though, if you are making some of the Italian cheeses that suggest that you add lipase, that you leave it out because there is a lot more lipase in goat's milk 
than there is in cow's milk. The reason we add lipase is because uh, of that it is lacking in cow's milk. So leave that out and you'll have a very, very similar, true to type. And a lot of the uh, the cheeses like halloumi and feta, they're made normally with goat's milk anyway. Um, what we do is use cow's milk and add lipase. So hopefully that's answered your question, Ada. Thanks very much for that. Okay, the next one is from Connie. Connie says, I enjoy your tutorials on cheese making. Thank you for the taking the time to do them. I made my first Yalesburg and it's at the stage of allowing the holes to develop. I'm happy with how it looks, but it has a strong, ripe blue cheese smell. I don't see any moulds growing on the rind, but I'm cleaning it with vinegar every day. Any thoughts? Thank you, Connie Paris. Well, Connie, um, it's supposed to smell nutty and fresh. However, keep wiping it so it doesn't dry out. Uh, it should be okay. I would wipe it with brine, not vinegar. Even though vinegar does kill bacteria, um, it may impart a more acidic flavour to your cheese. However, my question to you is, have you made blue cheese with the same equipment recently? Now, Connie did get back to me, and she said, Thank you, Gavin. Yes, I have been making a lot of blue lately. They are so easy and come out so well. The kitchen I am using is far from ideal from avoiding contamination, so it is very possible that some penicillin Roque 40 is a permanent resident. Thank you for the advice. Well, Connie, one of the ways to get rid of um, penicillium Roque 40 is to make a weak bleak sol bleach solution. So that's about 40 millilitres to 2 litres of water, just tap water. Um, so you mix that up and you sanitise all of your equipment with that, soak it for five minutes and then rinse it out with uh, fresh water. And hopefully that should sort out your blue smelling cheese because if you want to make other cheeses you don't want them all smelling like blue cheese unless obviously you really like blue cheese anyway thanks very much for your two for your question and your reply that was lovely okay the next one is from wayne and i think we've had wayne on the show before um giving me some uh, some questions it says hi gavin it's wayne from the northern rivers in new south wales um, he's made a Colby, and his question is, uh, Colby first, it has matured for an extra month and turned out satisfactory, having quite a sharp taste. Is this normal for a Colby? It has some small holes in the centre, and the sharpness is rem reminiscent of a cheese that is blown. This one did not, turn, this one did not and remained intact in its wax. Well, the answer is yes, Colby does get quite stronger the longer you leave it. So I do recommend, I think it's about three to four months is the maturation age. Certainly was for the Colby that I cracked open the other day. It was a lot stronger than um, the previous Colby's I've made because I did age it for an extra month and a half. Um, but it's not particularly sharp. It's still quite smooth, but it's a lot sharper than what it was. Obviously, as cheeses age, they become sharper. That's how you get, in store-bought cheese anyway, how you get vintage cheddars or sharp and bitey cheddars they're aged a lot longer um, and that same the same goes for normal um, homemade cheeses as well they will get sharper with age however there, there may have been some contamination there somewhere um, so just check for that when you're sanitizing your equipment now he's got another question um, he made some blue cheese he said everything was fine until week five when the cheese just collapsed when he opened up the centre, it was quite dry and had a lovely creamy Roque 40 smell with blue veins starting to show. I'm wondering if maintaining the moisture level too high for too long. Is there a protocol for reducing the humidity to the general cave level after a certain period? I've had this problem before too, Wayne. It, it does. The whole outside of the, the cheese may sometimes um, go all runny and fall off. I've had that before. So what I've done to alleviate that now is when I do make a Stilton, I wrap it in aluminium foil. Now, it's not ideal because in France, when they do make Roque 40 cheese, they wrap it in tin, uh, not aluminium. Um, so this prevents the outer layer of the cheese from 
uh, going all sloppy uh, and falling off and collapsing. So I wrap it in tin foil. I leave the ends exposed um, because the ends are usually the bits that have the holes poked in them so that the uh, the blue veins can can form. So try that, give that a go, and uh, I reckon um, that will sort out your issue of collapsed blue cheese. So thanks, Wayne, for your question. <laughs> One final question, and this is a bit funny. Last episode where I did a, a full format show on episode 26, I featured a question from somebody who I thought was a woman. Uh, and this was... Um, I thought it was pronounced a uh, trouty. <laughs> it's not. I got an email back from. Uh, it's pronounced trusty, uh, and trusty uh, was the guy from uh, from Iceland. And guy, remember, <laughs> remember during the episode, I used just about every um, female term possible um, to answer the question. Anyway, here's a here's an email from trusty. Uh, Many thanks for confirming things should work properly. I had a good laugh at the podcast with my wife. I am very much an Icelandic two metre tall male with bearded face, stinky feet and all the other male parts. Never have I been so thoroughly feminised before, but I have to say that I really enjoyed the experience and my wife was hurting from laughing of every instance of her or she, etc. Thanks again. <laughs> again, th- many thanks for the info and the laughs. Trusty. A trusty's got a picture of him wearing a big cowboy hat. Well, it looks like a cowboy hat, smoking a big cigar. So um, I'll actually put the uh, the little photo in the show notes. It was hilarious. I, I had one of those oh my gosh moments. What have I done? Um, when I received the email the next morning after episode 26 was released. But I'm so glad that... Uh, that Trusty took it in uh, in good humour and uh, and gained a bit out of it. It certainly made me laugh once I got over the shock factor. Thanks, mate. You're a champion. <laughs> okay, um, that's all we got time for this week. I've actually gone a little bit over time, um, the normal 30-minute time slot. So for upcoming workshop dates... Uh, and all my recipes and my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home, can be found on littlegreencheese.com. Now, the ebook is available in all ebook formats, uh, and you will be, down, be able to download it on your portable device, or you can print it off as a PDF. You can find my cheese making video tutorials within the book or on my YouTube channel. Just search for the username Greening of Gavin and you'll see them all there. So thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese podcast. During this podcast, you heard loyalty free music by Kevin MacLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, the news theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows.